This is part two of our video from vectors to multivectors. See the video description below for links to parts one and three and other useful information. Picking up from the last slide in part one, we use the scalar product to introduce an orthonormal basis for our finite dimensional vector space. We focused briefly on Rn while discussing the geometry of the scalar product, but let's go back to allowing mixed signature spaces, replacing the positive definite property with a weaker requirement of non-degeneracy. I should point out that the geometric algebra of such a vector space, written g of v, is often referenced using only the signature of the space, like this. And the elements of GPQ, for reasons we'll get to shortly, are called multivectors. And as with Rn, writing Gn means Gn0. Now we're ready to introduce the geometric product. Note, from the geometric product we will introduce other useful products, in particular the inner and outer products, but the geometric product is the central product of our algebra. As such, if I say a times b or the product of a and b, it's understood that the geometric product is intended. We introduce the geometric product by insisting on the following four properties. First, the geometric product is associative. Hence, we can drop the parentheses here and just write ABC. Second, the geometric product is distributive over addition. Notice we do not assume that the geometric product is commutative, so both the left and right distribution formulas are needed. Third is the compatibility property, stating that the scalar 1, which is the unity element on R, is also the unity element for the geometric product. I won't go into the details here, but this assures us that the geometric product of two scalars is just the ordinary multiplication defined on R, and that the geometric product of a scalar and a vector is just the scalar multiplication mentioned in the vector space axioms. Many geometric algebra introductions don't mention this compatibility property, taking for granted these results, but I prefer having this property explicitly stated. The fourth property is contraction, telling us that the geometric product of a vector with itself is equal to the scalar product of that vector with itself. Notice that the first three properties apply to all multivectors, while the fourth property applies only to vectors. That's it. Insisting on a product satisfying these four properties will lead us directly to the elegant and robust multivector system of geometric algebra. Let's see how that's done. G of V is generated as the algebraic closure of V with respect to the geometric product and addition. So V is in G of V since it's the vector space we're starting with. The vectors in V are the building blocks of our multivector system, so they are called the grade 1 objects of G of V. The contractive property results in G of V containing the scalars as well. For example, consider E1 and 7E1 in Rn. They're both vectors, so they're both in Gn, and so their product, which is 7, must be in Gn as well, and likewise for any other scalar replacing the 7. The scalars are designated as the grade 0 multivectors. Sometimes if I want to emphasize the grade, I may call a vector a 1 vector and a scalar a 0 vector. Elements in G of V could also be of mixed grade, like 5E1 plus 2 and so on. What else? Before getting into the higher grade objects in G of V, let's discuss a few very useful properties of the geometric product. First, scalars commute with everything. Now the constructive argument not presented in this video, demonstrating the implications of the compatibility property mentioned earlier, can easily be extended to include the property that scalars commute, so it's often taken for granted as well. But here's a short algebraic proof that I find instructive. Let lambda be a scalar, and ek an arbitrary element of our orthonormal basis for v. Then lambda ek is a vector, so the contractive property tells us lambda ek multiplied to itself is equal to the scalar product of lambda ek with itself, and bilinearity of the scalar product lets us pull out the lambdas, and using the contractive property again gives us this. Expanding the squares at both ends tells us we have this. For non-zero lambda, we can multiply both expressions by 1 over lambda from the left and ek from the right to get that lambda commutes with ek. Well, if ek is one of the basis elements that square negative, then we'll also have to multiply negative 1 from the right to get here. But in either case, we've just shown that scalars commute with the basis elements of V, and thus they commute with all vectors in V. Since all the elements in G of V are built from vectors, this proves that scalars commute with all multivectors. The next property tells us we can divide by vectors. Well, since we're allowing mixed signature spaces, I should qualify that by saying non-null vectors are invertible. Not only is this an incredibly useful algebraic property, it has profound implications for the vector differential operator when we extend calculus to a multivector setting. 
in a subject known as geometric calculus, or in some circles as Clifford analysis. In the vector algebra of R3, division is not something you can do with the dot product or the cross product separately, though if you have information from both those products, there is a way to invert the system that I'll discuss in the Q&A video I'm planning, but we'll soon see how the geometric product captures the information of both products, and the inversion process is much less complicated. For any non-null vector u, simply define u inverse like this. Since scalars commute, we immediately see that u is invertible, with u inverse equal to u over u squared. The following two properties involve the geometric product on parallel and orthogonal vectors. First, parallel vectors commute. The proof is very simple once you recall the definition of parallel vectors. Simply use the fact that scalars commute and you're done. Next, orthogonal vectors anti-commute. Among other things, these two results about parallel and orthogonal vectors will lead us in a future video to an intuitive and coordinate-free treatment of reflections and rotations. To prove this last property, Take two orthogonal vectors u and v. This equation is easily verified by expanding this term here, then canceling the u squared and v squared. By contraction, we get this. Next, we use the bilinearity of the scalar product to expand this term and use the symmetry of the scalar product while simplifying, resulting in this so-called polarization identity. And since u and v are orthogonal, this equals zero, telling us uv equals minus vu. Before moving on, I want to point out that we only used orthogonality at the very last step. So the result that uv plus vu equals twice the scalar product of u and v is true for any two vectors. Remember this result because I'll be using it again soon. Now let's decompose the geometric product into its symmetric and anti-symmetric components. This motivates the definition of two new vector products, the inner product defined here and the outer product defined here. Notice that the inner product is symmetric while the outer product is anti-symmetric. So the geometric product of two vectors is the sum of the inner and outer products. Let's take a deeper look at these two new products. Recalling this result from earlier, we see that the inner product is not only scalar valued, it's precisely the scalar product we started off with. The outer product, however, is something different. By the way, the inner product of u and v is commonly read u dot v and the outer product is read u wedge v. Introducing another geometric algebra convention here, multivector basis elements with more than one subscript means the geometric product of the vector basis elements with those subscripts. Since these basis vectors are orthogonal, if i is not equal to j, then eij equals minus ej_i, and the outer product of ei and ej becomes eij. This is an interesting new object in our multivector system. For one thing, in Rn it squares to negative 1, meaning it's not a scalar or a vector. Let's explore the geometry of this new type of object further by considering two arbitrary vectors u and v in Rn. Starting with u squared v squared, since v squared is scalar valued by the contraction property, and scalars commute, u squared v squared is equal to uv v u. uv is this, and vu is this which becomes u dot v minus u wedge v, using the commutativity of the inner product and the anti-commutativity of the outer product. Since u dot v is scalar valued, the cross terms will cancel when you multiply this out, resulting in this. Recalling the geometry of the scalar product discussed in part 1, the square of u dot v becomes this. With a bit of elementary algebra, we solve for the square of u wedge v, and applying the Pythagorean identity, it simplifies to this. So u wedge v is an object with this magnitude, but its square is negative. Let's talk about the geometry here. The magnitude of u wedge v is the product of the lengths of u and v times the sine of the angle between them. Forming the parallelogram defined by u and v, we see that the magnitude of u wedge v is the area of the parallelogram. And if that makes you think of the cross product, these objects are closely related, in a way I'll point out in part 3. But unlike the cross product, u wedge v is not restricted to R3. This object is a bivector, our first example of a grade 2 object. We'll see that a simple k-vector, also called a k-blade, has a magnitude as well as a k-dimensional direction involving attitude and orientation. A one-vector has a linear attitude, which is the line spanned by the vector, and a directional orientation, distinguishing forward from backward traversals of the line, as indicated by the direction the vector is pointing. Compare that to our bivector here, whose two-dimensional direction has a planar attitude, which is the plane spanned by u and v, and a rotational orientation, since v wedge u is minus u wedge v. Add u wedge v to itself and you double its magnitude, 
but add U wedge V to V wedge U, and they cancel each other out. K blades that have the same attitude and magnitude, but opposite orientations, are additive inverses of each other. Now don't get too attached to the shape here. This is just one way of illustrating this bivector. If we had two different vectors defining a different shape parallelogram, but the vectors were in the same plane and the parallelogram had the same area, the outer product of those vectors would give us either the same bivector or its opposite, depending on whether or not the rotational orientations matched. Note, as with the cross product in R3, the outer product of two vectors is zero if and only if the two vectors fall on the same line. Assuming that's not the case, what if we include a third linearly independent vector w into the mix? u, v, and w define a parallelopiped. The object u wedge v wedge w is a trivector with a magnitude equal to the volume of the parallelopiped. The attitude of its three-dimensional direction is the three-dimensional space spanned by u, v, and w, while the orientation is determined by whether u, v, w forms a right-handed or left-handed system. In general, the outer product of k linearly independent vectors is a simple k vector with magnitude equal to the k-dimensional volume of the parallelotope defined by the vectors, the attitude is the k-dimensional space spanned by the vectors, and the orientation, relative to a given orientation for the k-volume, is either the same or opposite, depending on whether a matching basis order is attained by an even or an odd permutation of the vectors. This should be easier to understand after we finish our construction of G of V and explore some specific examples. A word of caution here. These definitions of the inner and outer products are for vectors. For example, it turns out this is the formula for the outer product of a vector and a bivector. This will be explained and developed further in a future video called Grades and Blades. I'll update the video description below to include an active link when that video gets posted. For now, please follow me over to part 3 of this tutorial, where we continue our construction of G of V and briefly explore some of the most important examples, like G3 and the geometric algebra of spacetime.